It was empire on a scale that has never been equaled. Mysterious, violent in the extreme, and endlessly inventive. Only one empire has survived for 4,000 years, China. All powerful emperors mobilized immense peasant armies for feats of engineering unparalleled in human history. A gilded tomb with rivers of flowing mercury. It's hard to believe that something like that could be purely the product of human labor. The world's longest canal. A naval fleet mightier than any that had ever put to sea. But none can compare to the monument that would change the face of the earth the Great Wall of China. This is the biggest project management in history. And yet, dynasty after dynasty, consumed by vanity and greed, would be toppled from power when the people rose up and oppression turned to destruction. At the dawn of civilization, the Chinese were there, and they are still here. Hello, I'm Peter Weller. When the Egyptians were building their pyramids, the Chinese already had sumptuous palaces for their kings. When Rome was planning its soaring aqueduct that would bathe its citizens and quench their thirst, the Chinese were redirecting an entire river by blowing up a mountain before gunpowder and building a dam that would irrigate thousands and thousands of acres of land and launch a population explosion the world had never seen. Four thousand years ago, Chinese civilization rose and spread across a vast area, one-third larger than the United States. But for centuries, China was in turmoil. Separate kingdoms battled for power and control. Conflict and combat ravaged the land. China was, as we think of it today, more or less, was made up of a number of states, all of which were fighting with one another for supremacy. The period was called the Warring States. By the third century BC, one kingdom emerged as the most powerful and the most ruthless. A western province, home to a hostile, warlike people. They were ambitious, forbidding, and determined to conquer and unite all seven kingdoms. They were called the Qin. Their unification of this vast land would create an empire like no other the world has ever seen. The Qin prospered in a region that was fertile and flat, with access to prime trading routes like the famed Silk Road, connecting them to the farthest reaches of China and beyond. Over time, the Qing developed two critical military advantages over the other kingdoms. From neighboring nomads and barbarians, the Qing mastered horsemanship. Simultaneously, they also changed strategy for waging war. Until now, wars had been fought by small platoons of nobles riding in chariots. But the recent discovery of new metal forging technologies led to mass production of weapons and the rise of a new type of warrior, the foot soldier. It was a time when the use of iron became much more widespread. So just at the same time as infantry armies, which tended to be much larger, came in, so it was possible to make more weapons. With this tactical breakthrough, the Qin launched an offensive to conquer all of China. As one kingdom after another fell, the Qin faced a new challenge, how to quickly produce enough food to fuel their now massive army. That responsibility fell to one man. His name was Li Bing, a Qin official who was one of the greatest hydraulic engineers of all time. Under his guidance, Chinese builders would construct a masterpiece of engineering. For centuries, the Min River had tormented the Chinese people, causing winter droughts and summer floods. 
Now, Li Bing was determined to harness its raging waters. The centerpiece of his plan was a levee that would create a whole new waterway, a channel to control flooding, as well as to provide a water supply for desperately needed food production. But Li Bing had an enormous problem. Mount Jiang, standing directly in the path of his irrigation channel, he couldn't move the mountain, so he decided to carve a path for his new waterway straight through it. Long before the invention of gunpowder, it would have taken decades to cut a path through the mountain by manual labor using only hammers and drills. The Qin military demanded more immediate results, forcing Li Bing to devise a bold new technology. He'd let the forces of nature do the heavy lifting for him. First, heating the rocks through controlled fires, then dousing them with cold water. This caused the boulders to crack into small pieces that could be carted away. Eight years after he started, Li Bing had blasted an irrigation channel straight through the mountain. Now he had to construct the enormous levee that would divert the waters of the Min into the new irrigation channel. Thousands of workers were brought to the site, working with nothing but muscle and chisels, carving out the earth. Remarkably, Li Bing designed a levee that could regulate the raging waters of the Min according to the season. In summer, more water could be driven to the irrigation channel to prevent flooding along the river. In winter, the proportions were reversed, directing more water into the river to avoid drought. By irrigating a vast stretch of Qin territory, Li Bing's levee triggered a massive population boom, and the military had a new base to launch attacks into enemy territory. The state of Qin was evolving into a powerhouse. And he used the wealth created by agriculture and the power created by the military to unite all of China. In 247 BC, that job was left to the Qin's new emperor, a 13-year-old named Ying Zheng. The young ruler assumed the throne with his mother acting as queen dowager. But Ying Zheng came to power in a palace teeming with enemies, already plotting his demise. Knives were being sharpened. At the top of the list of those who wanted him dead was his own mother. She now had a lover and two new sons she wanted on the throne. At the age of 22, Ying Zheng discovered her plot to have him killed. He had his mother banished and his stepbrothers and her lover killed. His authority was now absolute. With his throne secured, Ying Zheng sent his armies out to finish the job of unifying all of China. Only one kingdom stood in the way. They were called the Chu. In 238 BC, the Qin launched an epic all-out war on the Chu in a conflict that raged doggedly on for 15 years. Finally, in 223 BC, they too raised the banner of surrender. The last great obstacle to the Qin conquest of China had been crushed. The Qin supremacy over the Chu is they were able to organize their armies in a much more efficient way than had been done before. The Qin dream of empire was complete. China was unified and at peace. Now a true emperor, Ying Zhang needed a royal name. He would come to be known throughout China and around the world simply as Shi Huangdi, the first emperor. Shi Huangdi proclaimed his dynasty would last 10,000 generations. It was during his reign that China embarked on perhaps the most spectacular construction project of all time, a wall unlike any the world had ever seen. 
But the Qing would pay a heavy price for their emperor's grand ambitions in the wrath of ruthless leaders and the blood of its own people. The Chinese invented deep drilling in the first century BC and were able to drill boreholes up to 4,800 feet deep. 220 BC, China's first emperor, the triumphant Shi Huangdi, sets off to survey his new empire. For the first time ever, China was unified and secure, and he intended to keep it that way with the most ambitious engineering project ever conceived, the Great Wall of China. Well, the Great Wall was a linking up of walls that had existed previously. A number of states in the north of China had built walls partly to defend against one another, but more importantly, to defend their northern frontier. It remains to this day unsurpassed by modern engineering, a single impregnable barrier to seal the vast Chinese empire from the outside world, along a border that stretches for thousands of miles. This is Chongchong. In Mandarin, it means long wall. And believe me, covering more turf than the continental United States is wide, and including all of its spurs that go off into no place, it's 6,000 miles. And man, that's long. Shi Huangdi, China's first emperor, started building it 2,000 years ago. It was worked on right up until the 17th century. But the original wall didn't look like this. It was kind of a mud brick affair, but it presented an interesting engineering challenge nonetheless, because it had to go all the way from the sea in the east to the Gobi Desert in the west, just to keep the northern nomads like the Mongols out and the Chinese people in. If it took the audacity of emperors to dream great, it took the relentless drive of the Chinese labor force to build great, but not without a price. Their capacity to endure hardship was unimaginable. Men, women, and children worked with their hands on this wall, and if you complained or tried to run away, you were killed. Disease was constant, injury was commonplace. Dressed only in rags, these people suffered bitter cold, bitter hunger, bitter exhaustion. Records say that at the height of production on this wall, close to one-fifth of China's entire labor force, one million people were working here, and a quarter of those people died. And if you died here, usually you were buried here, in the wall, giving rise to its other nickname among some, the Long Graveyard. Millions of arms and legs and backs were broken to build the wall. There is very moving poetry, mostly written by wives and mothers, about young boys going off and working on the Great Wall Project, not having food, dying in the uh, cold winters, and never returning home. But brute force would not be enough. Different regions had vastly different terrain and varying construction materials on hand. Wherever possible, engineers added to existing walls but most of it was built from scratch. They devised a brilliant system utilizing one material they had in abundance. The tamped earth method is what Chinese is called a hang tu. What this means is that you build a wooden frame to enclose the wall, and uh, you start low with, say, two boards parallel, and then you pour some gravel and some sticks and some clay, and then you use the end of a log to beat it and pound it until it's very, very compact. And then you put another layer in, and you keep doing that. And then you put other uh, boards on the outside to hold it in place, and you keep going up and keep going up until you reach the height that you want. When it was dry, the frame was removed, leaving just a solid slab of tamped earth, strengthened by the willow reeds like the steel rebar that reinforces modern concrete. The southern side, facing China, was defended by a simple parapet, while the northern side, facing the barbarians, was crenellated. There was a guard tower every 700 to 1,000 yards. A paved road ran along the top of the wall for troops and even wagons, making it an efficient communications route, especially for the soldiers stationed at each tower. But as a work of military engineering, 
the wall was only partially successful. A wall exists to be defended, but in the long run, the wall was not very defensible. Nomads could break through it or go around it, bribe their way through it. But the Great Wall was not only designed to keep barbarians out, it was also a symbolic dividing line, locking the Chinese in. The Great Wall, in a sense, is a cultural marker as much as it is a military fortification. It's the way of the Chinese saying to the nomads, you stay out there and raise horses and sheep, and we'll stay in here and grow grain. By 210 BC, the Great Wall had stretched over 3,000 miles, leaving an indelible mark on China's harsh terrain. But resentment was swelling into a rage against Shi Huangdi. Many in his kingdom felt the colossal barrier was not worth the toll it inflicted on the Chinese people. Once again, his enemies were plotting against him. Shi Huangdi's final years were marked by what I think is reasonable to call paranoia. But as the old joke says, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean people aren't out to get you. At least three assassination plots came very close to succeeding. Shi Huangdi struck back by turning China into a virtual prison for its people. He ordered all historical records of his ruthless regime destroyed. Punishment for anyone who didn't comply was forced labor or even death. Some 400 people were buried alive as a lesson to those who spoke out against the regime. When the emperor's eldest son objected, even he was banished. Shi Huangdi's brilliant vision had transformed China into a great empire but he paid the price with a descent into madness. He would now turn his obsessions and his army of forced labor to another stunning feat of construction begun years earlier, a monument to his own fear and death. In the 1040s, movable type printing was invented in China, a huge development in the history of printing. By 220 BC, Qin Emperor Shi Huangdi has united China for the first time. On the northern border, millions are toiling and dying, laying the foundation for China's signature engineering triumph. The 3,000 mile long Great Wall. But the first emperor wasn't done. Even as he fought against other Chinese kingdoms and his own demons, Shi Huangdi began to garrison nearly 700,000 men near his capital in central China to build the most personal of all his engineering projects, an epic tomb he had begun planning at the age of 13. This was a monumental project that required the labor of thousands and thousands of people over a very long time. It was, by design, the biggest and best tomb that China had ever known. In 1974, farmers digging a well came face to face with an ancient Chinese warrior. The mysterious terracotta skull would prove the gateway to one of the greatest archeological discoveries of all time. The mound is huge. The mound was always known to be the tomb mound of the first emperor. What was a total surprise was the uh, army of terracotta warriors about a kilometer to the east of the tomb, who presumably were guarding the approach to the tomb itself. Season after season of excavation since the 1970s has yielded more than five large pits the individualized faces and drapery and armor suggest that each one of these warriors was molded from the life from an individual separate human being. The precision and detail in the sculpting, the firing of the clay are unmatched today. These warriors are a colossal achievement and some believe the greatest archeological find of the 20th century, but they are only the tip of the iceberg because this ghost army 
only served as a guard detail for an engineering feat as fantastic as the world has ever known, the opulent tomb of Shur Hong Di. Each statue stands between five feet eight inches and six feet two inches tall, giants for the time. Some weighed up to 600 pounds, but it was the terracotta itself that sent shockwaves through the teams excavating the site. The clay had a hardness beyond anything they'd ever seen before, indicating that Shi Huangdi's artisans had developed a revolutionary new technology, blast furnace kilns that fired the statues at temperatures up to 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Archaeologists eventually uncovered three massive pits filled with the terracotta army guarding the first emperor's tomb. One pit alone contains over 6,000 life-size warriors and horses in battle formation. In a second pit, 1,300 of Shi Wangdi's elite military forces, including archers, chariots, and cavalry were discovered. While the third pit, with 68 figures and one chariot, was the command center of the entire army, headquarters for the defense of Shi Wangdi's empire, even in death. The military armor is fairly specific. We can tell that the uh, armor used was lacquered leather. We can see that people had cleats on the bottom of their boots to help them run in the mud. We can see the kinds of caps people wore and associate them with rank. 30-foot walls divided the massive complex, which stretches out for 7,000 yards into three parts, the outer city, an inner city, and then the mausoleum itself. During construction of the tomb, an army of workers excavated a gigantic terraced pit measuring about 1,600 feet by 1,700 feet, equal to 580 basketball courts. When the sprawling tomb complex was complete, it was topped with a terraced mountain of earth, nearly 400 feet tall. At the time, it may have been nearly as large as the Great Pyramid of Giza in Egypt. But over 2,000 years, weather has worn down the original man-made mountain to about 250 feet. It's hard to believe that something like that could be purely the product of human labor, but it is. That mound was put there, basket full of earth after basket full of earth uh, to cover what we assume is, a, is an entire underground city dedicated to the afterlife of the first emperor. Shi Huang Di's tomb is definitely the expression of a guy who wanted his empire to blow away everything the world had ever known. The ceiling is said to be a night sky studded with constellations made out of pearl. The floor, an entire recreation of his empire in miniature with pavilions and pagodas by a flowing river of mercury. The king himself laid out in gold and jade in a bronze coffin floating on a pool of mercury. Now, all this is pretty fantastic and mind-blowing, but is it true? Well, scientific tests have proven mercury levels 100 times the norm around the mountain, and ground-penetrating radars detected a room inside the mountain 33 feet high. So the emperor's tomb may be all it's cranked up to be, but we're going to have to wait to find out, because the Chinese government has decided not to excavate the place until they have the technology to preserve what's inside. And even then, once they go in, it may be a very treacherous dig. There were corridors and trapdoors and booby traps that were designed to prevent tomb robbing. Now, we assume that those are no longer operable after a couple thousand years, but I'm sure whoever goes into that tomb first is going to step carefully. Xi Huangdi had boasted the Qin Dynasty would last 10,000 generations. But just three years after his mysterious death, the vast empire collapsed. The first emperor paid a steep price for his epic engineering projects. The Great Wall and magnificent tomb bankrupted the country and ultimately broke the backs of China's peasants. Pushed to their limits, the people revolted, and China was plunged into chaos. Xi Wangdi, 
is said to have died from ingesting mercury, which he believed to be an elixir of immortality. Shi Huangdi, the first emperor of a united China, is dead. Few mourn. Many have eagerly anticipated an end to the hated and ruthless Qin dynasty. A vicious power struggle ensued for control of the empire. In a word, it was chaotic. Very quickly, after the death of Qin Shi Huangdi, things fell into civil war with various people vying for power. 206 BC. A new ruler comes to power determined to bring stability to China. His name was Liu Bang, a former soldier and cunning politician who knew how to win the hearts and minds of the people. Over the next four years, Liu Bang consolidated his rule and rallied the people behind him. Peace and stability returned to the empire. By the time he died in 195 BC, he had launched a dynasty that would thrive for nearly four centuries, the Han. The Han embarked on a wall-building campaign even more massive than Shi Huangdi's. They extended the Great Wall much further to the west than it had been and set up a set of garrisons and a series of watchtowers that guarded the trade routes out into Central Asia. Uh, for hundreds of miles to the northwest of the capital. The Han built their fortresses at closer intervals than earlier dynasties, every one to three miles. In areas of heavy enemy activity, that could increase to only 500 yards apart. Han soldiers had three critical missions along the wall, defend against invasion, gather military intelligence on enemy activity, and keep the vital beacon towers maintained and supplied with beacon fire fuels. Han Dynasty signal towers incorporated several sorts of alarms. Flags and smoke were only used in the daytime. Torches were only used at night. Bigger bonfires and drums were used at any time. And complex codes were devised for these signals. And just like today, modern codes, they were all classified as top secret and unknown to the public. From around 200 BC to 200 AD, just about the time that Rome was dissolving as a republic only to be reborn as an empire that would gobble up and transform the Western world, China was an empire that was consuming and transforming the East. During the Han Dynasty, the population of China grew to 50 million people. The empire went as far south as Vietnam, as far west as Afghanistan. It was massive. But after 400 years, just like Rome, internal disintegration started to overshadow military success. And in 184 AD, a peasant rebellion brought the Han Dynasty to a screeching halt. And once again, China was on the verge of chaos. For three centuries, warfare, treachery, and death were the rule in China. And once again, it took a ruthless hand to put an end to the time of turmoil. In the sixth century, a northern people, the Sui, declared war on the chaos, conquering one part of the empire after another, until China was united again for the first time since the Han Dynasty fell three centuries earlier. The Emperor Yangdi would build the Sui Empire on the foundation of nearly 1,000 years of dynasties that came before. Unlike previous emperors who had concentrated on fortifying China against the outside world, Yangdi would channel his energies inward and strengthen his empire within its borders. China is vast and its waterways provided the most efficient means of transportation over such great distances. Two major rivers traverse the country east to west, the Yangtze in the south and the Yellow River in the north, but they are a thousand miles apart. China was a house divided. Yang Di decided to do something about that. He aimed to link northern and southern China by a gigantic central artery, a grand canal. 
a kind of hydraulic highway for merchants, soldiers, and citizens. Very common to China uh, in terms of constructing um, any large infrastructure project. You know, they would look at existing waterways and try to find area where they could connect and link the entire uh, canal. They want to take advantage of the natural uh, geography. This gigantic construction project would take more than one million man days of work, most of it digging. Living and working conditions were horrendous, harsh and primitive. Tens of thousands died of starvation, fatigue and illness. Many were simply beaten to death by overseers. More than 24 locks were needed to create a massive network of channels. But every time you encounter a natural body of water, you need a lock to make a barrier between the canal and the lake or the river. When you go up any uh, significant grade, you have to have locks to uh, raise the water and the boats with it to get over any uh, rise in the terrain. It took five million workers over six years to build the Grand Canal. When it was built, it stretched 1,200 miles, and it was the longest and most ambitious canal project that had ever been enacted on the Earth up to that time. By connecting the Yellow River with the Yangtze, the Grand Canal could now transport goods up to 45 miles a day. Major cities along the canal grew into silk, porcelain, and cotton centers. Merchants and artisans supplied manufactured goods to opening markets throughout the entire country. Economically speaking, it made inter-regional trade much easier, as well as providing work for a lot of people, building it, maintaining it, working on it, transporting goods and people up and down it. Like the Nile in Egypt, it integrated the north and the south, strengthening the foundations of a unified empire. Well, the canal was a tremendous generator of wealth. There was opportunity for poets to travel, for painters to uh, wander and uh, begin painting landscapes. So it really was an engine of cultural development, not just along its own route, but uh, with influence far beyond uh, its own confines. With his engineering feat completed, Emperor Yang Di decided it was time for a victory tour down the Grand Canal. It was a garish spectacle, with an entourage of thousands traveling in opulence that bordered on the obscene. Well, the emperor had beautifully appointed luxurious imperial barges that could take him down the Grand Canal. So he would spend as much as half of every year enjoying himself in the sunny south. The emperor redefined luxury demanding exquisite foods and exorbitant tribute from every county and town along the canal. When large amounts of leftover delicacies were dumped overboard, the destitute who built the canal watched from the shore in despair. But once again, a Chinese emperor underestimated the power of the people. His voyages of conspicuous consumption fueled a mounting sense of rage against his decadent regime. In 618 AD, the people rebelled in a series of peasant uprisings throughout the country. Once again, chaos consumed China and soon reached the palace itself. Emperor Yang Di was killed by his own generals and the Sui dynasty came to an abrupt end. But with the empire united again, the stage was now set for China's golden age. And for the first time, China's engineers would extend the empire's reach around the globe. From the fourth century BC on, the Chinese used blast furnaces to cast iron, nearly 1,800 years before its widespread use in Europe. Six centuries ago, an astonishing armada of Chinese ships crossed the China Sea before venturing west to Ceylon, Arabia, and East Africa. It was a fleet unlike any that had ever put to sea. Giant nine-masted junks 
escorted by dozens of supply ships, patrol boats, and transports for cavalry horses. Crew totaled more than 27,000 sailors and soldiers. This was the famed armada of the powerful Ming Dynasty, a herald to the world that after a century of Mongol domination, China was returned to its rightful rulers. At its helm was an unlikely admiral, a commoner from the outlying Yunnan province, who rose to become one of the most powerful figures of the Ming Dynasty. His name was Zheng Ha. Zheng Ha was 11 when his hometown was conquered by the Ming. He was plucked from his family, brought to court as a gift for the emperor's son, and castrated. Eunuchs appear often in Chinese history, and the reason that they gained power was because they had much greater access to the emperor and to imperial women because they didn't pose a threat. Zheng Ha soon rose through the ranks to become the chief lieutenant to the emperor himself. Together, they sketched out a bold plan for conquest of the seas. Zheng Ha was named to lead an extraordinary fleet of ships. It was an engineering challenge unlike anything a Chinese dynasty had ever attempted. He was somebody who definitely wanted to create a personal stamp on the world. He ordered 337 ocean-going ships. An additional 188 flat-bottom transports were converted for ocean travel just to get the building materials together, get the craftsmen, get the designers and all the rest, and then say put together a fleet of 300 ships is remarkable. I mean, the British fleet in the time of uh, Napoleon had had a really an upper limit of about 100 ships of the line, men of war. An army of 30,000 carpenters, sailmakers, and sailwrights worked and lived at the shipyards, working day and night on Zheng Ha's magnificent fleet. At the center of the enormous shipyard, seven 1,500-foot dry docks were separated from the Yangtze River by 25-foot high dams. Once the ships were complete, the dams were opened, flooding the dry docks. The flagship of the fleet was a spectacular nine-masted vessel measuring 440 feet, nearly 1.5 times the length of a football field making it the largest wooden ship ever built. Designed for stability, it had a flat bottom filled with heavy ballasts of stones and an innovative exterior rudder post that could be raised to reduce the ship's draft in shallow waters. Watertight bulwark compartments, inspired by the partition shape of bamboo stalks, stored drinking water and supplies and kept the ship afloat if the hull was breached. The second deck had living quarters for the crew. The kitchen, mess hall, and operations were on the third, while the fourth deck was used as a high fighting platform. Fully rigged, the flagships had nine staggered masts and 12 square sails of red silk soaring skyward. Other ships were armed with as many as 24 bronze cannons, capable of firing up to 900 feet. Their bows and sterns had reinforced high profiles for ramming smaller boats. Some ships carried horses or transported troops. Others were freshwater tankers, packed with provisions for up to 28,000 men. We're talking about a really, really big fleet. It had as many soldiers and sailors on it as the Spanish Armada of 1588. It had about twice as many ships. In 1405, the eunuch commander Zheng He set sail for the world. Zheng He was not an explorer. Uh, what Zheng He was doing was what we would call in modern terminology power projection. During his 28-year naval career, Admiral Zheng He visited 37 countries, traveled around the tip of Africa into the Atlantic Ocean, and commanded a single fleet whose numbers surpassed the fleets of all Europe combined. Zhang Ha's voyages established China as a superpower on the world's oceans. But in 1433, 
China's age of exploration came to a crashing halt. Zheng He suddenly died during a stopover in India, and the fleet was recalled to China. A new emperor was on the throne. In one stunning command, he would change the course of Chinese history. Despite China's total domination as a naval power, Zheng He's magnificent fleet was to be burned to the ground. It would be one of the great turning points in Chinese history. China was poised to seize control of the seas and colonize the world years before the Portuguese, Spanish, Dutch, and British. Under the new emperor, all ocean-going vessels were destroyed. Even records of Zheng He's expeditions were torched. China's age of exploration was over. The open door slammed shut. The ships were gone, and the promise of international power and conquest was dead. The reason for the emperor's decision remains a mystery to this day. 1449, 16 years after the empire turned inward again, China's age-old enemy returned. Mongol forces mounted a massive attack. Like great dynasties before them, the Ming returned to the wall for protection. The result would be the most monumental feat of the entire Chinese empire, a complex re-engineering of the Great Wall into the colossal structure we know today. Earlier walls had been primarily made of stamped earth. The Ming walls were faced with, a, with brick and stone. They were much more solid, and those are the ones that we can still see parts of today. A crude mortar of sticky rice and burnt lime created a seal between bricks that rivaled modern cement in strength. Construction of military fortifications on the Great Wall reached its peak under the Ming. Double walls were added in military zones, along with strongholds, passes, and other reinforcements. Watchtowers of various shapes and sizes served as shelters or simply as signal stations along the wall. Shelter towers were built large enough to store food and arms and serve as the living quarters for soldiers. A staircase from the interior led up to the top of the tower, with small holes on each side of the wall for lookouts. The overall defenses were enhanced with a variety of features, including artillery. The Chinese have a clear superiority over the Mongols in gunpowder weapons. And uh, as long as the Ming Dynasty could maintain a cohesive enough army along the Great Wall, uh, they were capable of resisting individual Mongol attacks. By the end of the Ming Dynasty, over 6,000 miles of wall, including its many loops and digressions, sprawled across northern China. For a century and a half, the wall stood firm, but by 1600, the dynasty behind it was crumbling, and a foreign tribe known as the Manchu were gathering strength on China's northern border. On May 26, 1644, Beijing finally fell to Manchu forces. It would take the Chinese more than 250 years to overthrow the invaders from the north. But when they did, a new Chinese kingdom emerged, like none before it, communist China. Nothing symbolizes the enduring power and imagination of the Chinese more than this great wall. Of all of the civilizations that have reached the glorious heights of empire, only one has avoided the inevitable oblivion that follows. Emperors come and go, but for thousands and thousands of years, from the dedication and vision and resilience and brilliance of these remarkable people, they have pushed their civilization to triumph again and again and again, where others have simply morphed or dissolved or just faded away. At the dawn of humanity, the Chinese were here and they are still here, and they ain't finished yet. I'm Peter Weller for the History Channel.